grim-faced blokes in military uniforms and that glaring at you. And I always used to hurry past them when my gran, who, who brought me up, took me to the musicals all over London. And she agreed with me. She said, statues celebrating men who were responsible for killing people. Not right. They should celebrate people who made us happy, made us laugh and sing and entertained us. But no one ever did until fairly recently. Now, we're more intelligent now, we have statues of our favourite entertainers all over the country. Eric Morecambe in Morecambe, Les Dawson in Blackpool, Ken Dodd in Liverpool, Norman Wisdom and George Formey on the Isle of Man, Max Miller in Brighton, and in Telford, Ar Thetford I should say, Arthur Lowe, Captain Mannering, <laughs> by our sculptor Sean and it's a beautiful job he did with it too. No women, though, among that list until today. Eh? When I told friends in the business and lots of other people too, their reply was a 100% about time and all. We're only, we owe today's celebration to the people that have already been thanked, particularly Seb and Grace's great number one fan, John Taylor, Janet Emsley, and the Rochdale Council. Well, it's always an event when a council do something that everyone agrees with, isn't it? <laughs> Today is a celebration for Rochdale for all of us who agree that Gracie Fields was the greatest female performer this country has ever produced. A witty, a witty, gloriously voiced, down-to-earth, wonderful entertainer and actress. Now, there are lots of other performers who we admire for their talent and everything, but how many do we love? Gracie was loved. Our Gracie, and not only by Rochdalians, but by all of us. She was our Gracie too, you know. She was one of us. She was the same all the way through her life. She was great at removing pomposity. Thank you. <laughs> I was just getting to the tag, Grace. Don't kill it. In the 78, when she was made a dame, she announced to the press, she said, so now I'm a dame. Great. As long as they don't call Boris Buttons. She, said, <laughs> she did a straight play in London with the great actor Sir Gerald de Maurier, who fancied her and chatted her up. And her reply to him was, leave it out. You're old enough to be me bloody dad, she said. <laughs> the cast in that play was a very legit sort of play, cold-shouldered her, and never spoke to me because they thought, oh, someone from Variety, that's all we need. And it really got up her nose. So one morning just before rehearsals, she did three cartwheels across the stage and turned to them and said, now, can any of you boogers do that? She said, <laughs> Oh, no, she, she, uh, M M M Maria himself said, well, it's very difficult having Gracie Fields in the show because she dies at the end of Act Two, he said. And at the start of Act Three, I come on and there's only a third of the house left. <laughs> They've followed her across to the Palace Theatre where she was topping the bill in variety. How about that for a double? Not bad, eh? And just a couple of personal stories. I first met Grace uh, with my agent of 50 years, a man called Maurice Aza. And Maurice was Grace's nephew. And he was uh, his uncle was Archie Pitt. Not a very nice man, but she did actually say about him, Grace, he was the man who made me a star. And his brother, Bert, sister Lillian, they were both Grace's agents. And I met her in Maurice's garden walked in and she's sitting at the table there with the, her agent and that and she looked and she introduced him to me and she said are you as funny as you look <laughs> I said well I hope so she said you'll do well then I tell you <laughs> I last saw her just down the road from here at the Batley Variety Club very very blase audience they were then they'd had everybody there all the biggest stars in the world and lots of them sat there thinking Who's this little old lady coming on here now? And she walked on, Sally, Sally, politish applause, but she wasn't doing that great. Then she spoke to the conductor, 
and all the music went up in the air and the lads all changed the order and she went into a song that was number one in the charts that week. Those were the days, my friend. And I heard for the very first time just what the words this, this little, little old lady had brought to life. She'd lived a life that the song was all about. She paralyzed them and followed it with following the Rochdale hounds. She said. <laughs> that went straight into it. Once she got them, she was away. She looked around at the room at the audience at Butley, noshing their fried suppers, and she said, I was born in a fish and chip shop, you know. I never thought I'd be singing my songs in once. <laughs> but I stayed, I had the great joy of staying in Capri with her a couple of times. And I remember the first afternoon I was there, I sat next to her while she answered her fan mail. She was nearly 80, and there were dozens of letters. And she answered every single one in her own handwriting on a postcard of Capri, plugging her restaurant. <laughs> and the evening I'll never ever forget as long as I live, a magic time. We were sitting on the balcony of a house in Anna Capri, looking out at the purple sky with covered in, in stars. And she confided and she said, well, they've asked me to do another LP. You know, LPs, we used to call them in those days. <laughs> She said, they've asked me to do another LP. I said, oh, that's great, Grace. And she said, yeah, but it's a bit disappointing. They only want me to do the old songs, you know, Sally and Biggest Aspidestra and all that. And I'd like to do some new ones. She said, I, I have some wonderful new songs out now. She did actually record one marvellous one, the theme from The Godfather, Speak Softly Love, that one. She did it so beautifully. But she said, there's one song I'd really like to record. And I said, what's that? And she sat there that gorgeous evening in Capri, the evening, and she sang Send in the Clowns. And whilst I'm telling you the story now, the hairs are going up on the back of my neck, really. It was a marvellous moment. Now, she played the Palladium so many times, but Lillian Azer, her agent, told me about the most important one. Now, I'm sure you all know about the this, but during the war, the press accused her of abandoning the country, wrongly. And it got so bad that Churchill in the House of Commons said, this vilification of Miss Gracie Fields must stop. She is the greatest worker for the war effort, a greater than anyone I know. And they stood there at the Palladium. This was her big comeback, her first appearance after all this bad stuff had been said about her. And Lillian and her husband were her agents and they're standing at the back of the theatre, Palladium. And they said, look, Grace, you must tell us what songs you're going to sing. It's so important. We must capture the people back again. And she said, went right through the list. She was terrific at putting a list of songs together. But she wouldn't tell them what she was going to open her act with. So they're standing at the back and they're holding hands and they're thinking, this could be our living down the swan. It really could. On came Grace, Sally, Sally. Reasonable applause, but what did she start? Her first song, La Vion Rose, of which the opening line is, take me to your heart again. What about that? For someone who really knew what she was about. But today, today's world of entertainment when people win fame and fortune via a couple of weeks on a TV talent show and they're called stars. They're usually kids who haven't learnt their business. Gracie went through the car from the age of eight. What an apprenticeship, eh? Theresa May would be proud of her, I tell you. <laughs> she became, before the world had even been thought of, a superstar. A superstar and a star human being. So welcome back to Rochdale and particularly Christmas Tree Island. Dame Gracie Fields.